So, we talked about um, Ohm's Law, and the thing to remember about circuits, you know, you're measuring I, delta V, and R, and the relationship between the three is given by this expression. And, we, and I gave a model of electrons flowing through a wire. And I derived an equation for the current. It looks like this. So I'm going to say something a little bit more general. Oh, one more thing. If I take the current and divide by the area, I get this thing called the current density, which is just N Q V sub D. I want to be a little bit more general in my description in this next slide. J is really a vector. It, it represents a flow of charge. Again, we're going to go back to the idea of flux. Okay. So J, J is actually a vector. And I want to say this because when we get to the material magnetism, yes. I'm sorry, there's going to be some problems that we're going to encounter where we need to understand what J is. That's all. Okay. So I'm just I'm, I'm giving you this um, description because uh, we're going to need it later. That's, that's really it. So imagine, if you take a look at the slide that I have, this is the, exactly the same slide as I used when we talked about um, Gauss's law and electric flux. Consider a volume where a fluid's passing through it, and it could be a fluid of charge, or it could be water flowing through that uh, system. And using the same uh, arguments as I did earlier when we talked about this, the volume of particles passing per unit time through, uh, through an area, dA, is just V dot N dA. Okay, so where did I get that? So let me go up on the board. We have a bunch of particles passing through this surface. And I'm asking, in some time delta t, how many particles pass through here, or the volume of particles? Okay. Well, the volume of particles that pass through here is going to be given by this area, which I'll call, for now it's called dA. Times the volume, the, uh, the, the velocity of the, or the basically the, the, the distance the particle travels in the direction of the tiny t. The only particles that will cross this barrier are those particles that have a component of its velocity perpendicular to this area. And that's why I have to do, take a dot product. With the normal to the surface, because only the components of the perpendicular to the surface will actually pass through the surface. And then times delta t will give me dv. And so dv dt is just d not n yet. So that's where I got that first expression. Professor? Yeah. Um, are you sure that the mic is the right mic you're using? Or right. are you... You can't hear me very well? Yeah, yeah it's not very good. You're right. Sorry. How about now? Is that better? Yeah, that's a lot better. Okay, sorry about that. So, I derived this couple of weeks ago when we talked about Gauss's law, okay? So the number of particles passing through any unit area is going to be this times um, 
with the density of particles I have, the number of particles per unit volume. So if I multiply this by, by n, then that's going to give me um, n times v sub d dot n dA. And of course, if I multiply both sides by delta t, then it gives me the number of particles in the volume dV. And I can do this for both sides of that surface. So let me go back to the slide. So I can do this for both sides of that surface. And again, if there's no, uh, if um, the density is constant, the density of particles is constant, then V1 has to be equal to V2, has to be equal to V sub D. And if there's no fluid or so, uh, no source of fluid or, or drain of um, charge or flu uh, of anything, then the number of particles entering the left side of the system has to be equal to the number of particles leaving the right side. So that means, I'll go back up on the board, if there's no source or drain of fluid, it could be charge, it could be water, whatever you want to call it, then the number entering on this side has to be equal to the number leaving on this side. Okay. And then we can say then that um, on the left we have V sub D delta T, and we can cancel out the delta T's anyway, but uh, V sub D delta T and A1 equals delta T and A2 V sub D dotted with the normal. And we can get rid of these delta t's. OK. So we can talk about the number of particles per unit volume that's passing on the left is equal to number of particles per unit volume that's passing on the right. If I multiply this by q, then that gives me the charge per unit volume that's passing the left equals the, the charge per unit volume that's passing through the right. So if we write it, if we multiply by Q, we'll get this. Sorry, I didn't mean to put absolute values here. Oh yeah, I did, I, I did here, sorry. And this is the amount of current di in a volume dv per unit time. Let's focus on this term. If I, multi if I, divide, oops, if I divide both sides by a, if I do this infinitesimally, which I screwed up, sorry. If I do this infinitesimally, then di dA, the current per unit area, is n times v sub d dot n hat. Sorry, I had too many n's. Times q. This is called a current density. OK. Or the charge density. It's, it's, really, it's, it's called a current density. There's a mistake on my slide. It's called a current density, j. That's written as a vector, a generic vector that, that works in every case. For the problems that we do in our class, J will always be perpendicular to the surface. Okay, because we're going to be talking about electrons flowing through a wire. So instead of me always, instead of me writing the current density this way, I'm going to write it this way, but I want you to be aware where this, where this comes from, that's all. That's why I gave you the introductory statement.
Okay. Professor? Yes. Um, if the expression for the vector j involves a dot product, how is it a vector then? Well, I'm taking the dot product of j with the normal, right? I would, uh, like the v sub d vector dot with the n vector. Oh, I made a mistake, didn't I? Sorry. Um, yeah, I screwed up, sorry. I should write it like that. And so then J So then J ends up being uh, N V sub D times uh, Q. Okay, I forgot the dot product here. Sorry about that. Thanks for pointing that out. Yeah, I got confused for a second. Okay, there. sorry about that. Say. So this, this is where the J vector comes from. Okay, that's where the J vector comes from. But we're not going to be using it. I mean, we're basically going to be using it in this form. Like I said... For the problems we do in chapter 27 and 28, um, J is going to be uniform. And it's going to be perpendicular to any area. So um, this is how we write it. But when we get to chapters 29, 30, 31, you want to know, kind of just get a conceptual understanding of what this J term is. This is all we're going to be doing with, J, with this J thing, okay? I'm just trying to, um, number one, I'm trying to relate this to the flux idea. And number two, um, you're going to see this when we do magnetism, when we calculate magnetic fields. Okay. And so the current then is basically the integral of J dot N dA, where, like I said, for our purposes, J and N are going to be parallel to each other and perpendicular to dA. So... Uh, we can just write I as J times A for the, for the most part. So, um, suppose we run a current through a battery and we have a light bulb. Work is done on the electrons, causing them to move, giving them kinetic energy. As the electrons move through a wire, they collide with the atoms in the wire. So what happens during the collisions? Well, they lose their kinetic energy. That, that loss in kinetic energy gets converted to heat. And so that's what happens in the bulb, and that's what causes the bulb to glow. The filament in the bulb will get hot, and the bulb will glow. So you, you can see you have, uh, if you're using a battery, you have uh, chemical energy getting converted into uh, electrical energy to kinetic energy and then to uh, thermal energy and then light. So you have a bunch of conversions of um, energy. The kinetic energy loss of the electrons will actually increase the vibrational energy of the atoms in the metal as they scatter off. And so uh, as a result, that causes the temperature to increase because temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy of mar of of um, molecules. The more vibrations you get, the higher the temperature of the material. So as the electrons are going through a material, they're dumping their energy into the, into the material. So if you've ever run um, something like a vacuum cleaner or something that draws a lot of current, you will notice that the cable gets warm, especially if you do it for a long time. So I want to uh, give you a, just a crude model of how electrons are moving through a wire. In order for the electrons to move through a wire, they require an electric field. 
The electric field produces an acceleration. Let me go to the board. The electric field produces an acceleration. And of course, that produces a change in velocity. So let's see what we can build, what kind of model we can build based on this idea. So we have a wire. And we have a delta V across the ends of the wire. That means we have an electric field. And so F equals Q times E equals M A. A is Q E over M. Let's say the field is uniform, which it typically is, then can we solve for V? Well, this is dV dt. So dV is Q E over M dt. We integrate both sides, and what do we get? So we can derive an equation for the velocity of the particles. We don't know, we can't figure out the velocity of every single electron in the wire. But we can, what we can do is look at the collective effect of the motion of all the particles. And so what I want to look at is the average velocity of the electrons that go through the wire. So what I want to do now is take a time average of this. I want the average velocity. This is a constant. Okay. Now I need to estimate what the heck t is. What is the average t? And what, normally when we build a model, the t that we use, those of you who have had 215, the t that you use is the average time between collisions. And so that's what I'm going to use here. So I'm going to call the t the average time then in this expression is the, the average time between collisions. And then I got to figure out what is my average initial velocities. And I'm averaging this over many, 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 many particles. And many, many, many different particles have all kind of different initial velocities. So what should this be? If I have a bunch of vectors, a lot of vectors with random orientations, what should this be? Is it zero? It's zero, right? I mean, if I just adding a bunch of random values, meaning I can have any value for this and I average them up, this ends up being zero. So then my V sub D is what I call the drift velocity. My, I'm sorry, my V average is called my drift velocity. And it's given by Q E over M times tau. Anybody want to get want to guess how big of a value that is? In a wire? Anybody want to guess how big that number is? No guesses? I'll tell you what the value is. V sub d is of the order, and, and then probably I'm going to overestimate it too, about one centimeter per second. Anybody have any concerns about that number? I thought it would be much higher than How that. come? <laughs> I mean, intuitively, it, it felt like it should be more than at least that number. Yeah, because, I mean, they're moving fast. They're tiny particles. They're moving fast, right? Yeah. But what are they doing? Remember, I'm, I'm taking, what I'm calculating is this distance divided by the time it takes to go through this distance. Remember that in between, they're, they're undergoing many collisions. Mm -hmm. 
right? I mean, there, there's all these atoms in this wire, and so the electrons, and I didn't draw enough, are you know bouncing off like this. And what I drew is underestimating what, what's really happening. And so this is surprisingly small number. That's why I asked that question. So somebody will say, wait a minute, so then why does the light turn on instantly when I flip the switch? All right? If, if they're going this slow, you should be able to flip the switch and sit in your chair before the light goes on. Right? But that's My not what happens. Why is that? If you have a hose full of water and you turn on the faucet, does the water come out immediately? No. Yeah, because so the wire has the wire is full of electrons at any time. So once you once you turn on the power, you you automatically get electrons moving. Okay. Yeah, so yeah, this is a surprisingly low, low value. And, and we, there are ex experimental techniques that allow you to measure this. Okay, so we have our model for current and current density. Why don't we take this thing and put it in this equation? My light takes some time to turn on. <laughs> Here it does? Okay. Yeah. Is I it, think it is old now. Oh, uh, is it fluorescent? Um, it, yeah. Okay, that's different. Okay, so let's put in our expression for V sub D into our equation. N is the number of charge carriers per unit volume. Q is the charge of those charge carriers. And then let's put this in there. Okay. And let me, let me factor out a key. I mean, let, let me just rearrange things a little bit. So um, I get nq squared over m times tau times e. And I'm gonna, this, this, everything in parentheses is a constant. m is the mass of the electron. Or we can say M is the mass of the ch whatever's carrying the charge. Typically in a wire, it's an electron. But uh, we, can, we can talk about this in other scenarios. And so we're going to let sigma be this thing in parentheses. So J is sigma E. And so the current, I, is J times A. We're assuming that the, the electrons are flowing perpendicular to the surface. And the, and the J is uniform because the electric field is uniform. So that means the current is going to be this times A. It turns out that this, this equation, the fact that J, the current density, is proportional to the electric field, this is Ohm's law. This, J is proportional to the electric field independent of the value of the electric field between the, between the wires. That's actually Ohm's law. That's a more fundamental way to write Ohm's law. Okay, and there are many materials where the ratio of J over E, the magnitude of J over the magnitude of E, is a constant. And those materials obey Ohm's law. So this is a, this is a more uh, elementary way of writing Ohm's law. Okay. This thing is called a conductivity.
and it's in coulombs per second meter squared. I'm sorry, it's, it's an amp per volt meter. So amp per volt meter. That's the, that's the units. And you can see in the slides where the amp per volt meter comes from. Another unit is the mole per meter. What is, what is mole spelled backwards? Is it one over resistivity? Yeah, it's, it's basically one over, res it's, it's, it's related to the res resistivity. But, but yeah, I mean, you read, uh, that's why they, they, wrote, they, they wrote the word ohm backwards. For the units. So yeah, this is one over resistivity. Which I haven't gotten to yet, but I will. So Ohm's law, like Hooke's law, or the ideal gas law, is really valid over a range of values of V. Because if you make E too big, then this equation is not going to work. Now, I, you know, granted, I, I, this is a simple model because I have completely neglected quantum mechanical effects, okay? And so, if this is going to be predictive, if we're going to assume that this quantity here is going to be predictive of uh, a real system, you know, in other words, if I measure the conductivity of material and I compare it to what this equation gives me, I'm probably going to be way off. I'm not taking into account quantum physics. But what this model shows is that I can actually derive an expression that gives me Ohm's law from the simple model, even though this thing is not accurate. I need more details. So since delta V, the potential drop depends, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm looking at magnitudes, okay? I know there's a minus sign missing there, but let's assume the magnitude of delta V is just the electric field times the length of the wire, okay? So maybe I want to write everything in terms of delta V because usually when you have a wire, you talk about the delta V across the wire with the battery. So I can substitute everywhere here delta V over L. Okay. So I can put here... Let me do it this way. The magnitude of J So it's because of the fact that we're we're considering J to be in one in one direction in our model, I'm just going to write I'm going to just look at the absolute values all the time, okay? I'm not going to write them formally as a vector. And that's usually what you do in one-dimensional motion and kinematics, okay? So J is delta V over L. Then we can write delta V Let me use my other marker. If I solve this for delta V, what am I going to get? I'm going to get L over sigma times J. But J is I over A. And so that gives me L over sigma times A times I. And I'm going to call this constant the resistance. So I've, I've derived an expression for the resistance. I've derived Ohm's law. So really, Ohm's law is really, fundamentally, it comes from this. I mean, when you do an experiment, it, right, you see it from here, but from a theoretical point of view, I mean, from a more 
elementary point of view, it, it shows that there's a relationship between J and E. You have a linear relationship between J and E. Okay. So delta V is R times I. And what is this thing called? What's well, the resistance, but what is... So we can say resistance is L over sigma A, L divided by that conductivity times the area. But if I define rho as 1 over A, or 1 over sigma, sorry, and I call it the resistivity, then we can write, let me know if you can't see it, So what does this say? The longer the wire, the greater the resistance. Okay, let me look at Kathleen's question. Would there be a sigma in the equation on the top board? Oh yeah, you're right, sorry. Thank you. Okay, so this is the, res the equation for the resistance. That tells you is if the wire is longer, you have more resistance. That, that should make sense because as I make the wire longer, the electron, as the electron goes through here, it's undergoing more collisions. It's gonna make it hard for charge to flow when this is longer. If I make this wider, then I have more paths for the electrons to go through, and so that makes the resistance lower. So if A is bigger, that makes R smaller. The electrons can pass through a lot more easily. Of course, this assumes, right, this assumes um, a constant shape. If this thing varies in shape, then this would have to be set up as an integral to calculate R. Okay. You would have to calculate R over a DL, write an equation for your area, and then integrate. So if you had a wire like this, Then what you'd have to do is calculate the resistance of that piece of thickness DL and then integrate over all those areas. Okay. For the most part, the problems we're going to be doing, the area stays constant. Of course, if I have a cube or like a, a rectangular object, If I hook up a power supply let me erase all this. This way. The value of R will be different than if I hook up the power supply like this. Do you guys all see that? So if I hook up my battery across the top and bottom as opposed to the left and right, my L and my A are gonna be different and so my resistance will be different. Does that make sense? Because it's gonna depend on which way I'm making the electrons flow. A lot of people forget, a lot of people forget that. Okay. I'm um, Professor? Yes. So uh, it, the resistivity is the uh, property of a material. Yeah. So um, yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna, I'm, I'm getting to that. But yeah, the resistivity and the conductivity are a property of the material. Okay. And the one thing that you see here is you don't see any. Well, you see essentially it's constant, right? Right, because sigma is n q squared over m times tau, right? And the resistivity is 1 over that. Mm -hmm. You just see a bunch of con, but in reality it's not. In reality, 
uh, the resistivity depends on temperature. Why? I mean, what, what's missing? Well, I didn't take into account quantum effects. And I can't. Is it, I, I can't in the, here, okay. I'm sorry, go ahead. Is it also because the higher temperature increases the number of collisions? Correct, it does, but my equation, my equation doesn't show that though, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So again, the, the units for R is the ohm, like we said before, and a typical units for a resistance are either mega ohm, kilo ohms. Resistances in ohms produce large currents. The quantity rho that I show there is called a resistivity. This rho is L over sigma times A. And again, this sigma is obtained from a model. It's not accurate at all, because I'm forgetting, I'm, I'm neglecting quantum effects, okay? Uh, but you can measure from experiment. Are you, and there's folks in solid state physics who actually try to derive expressions for this, which is very difficult because you've got to write an equation for all the motion of all the particles in the medium. Okay, that's kind of tough. So you have to use various statistical methods to actually derive this equation. Um, the unit for the resistivity is an ohm meter. Whereas for the conductivity, it's a mole per meter. Okay. For conductors, um, the resistivity is of the order of about 10 to the minus 8 ohm meters. So for conductors, And for insulators, for ideal conductors, this is zero. For ideal insulators, this is infinite. Okay? But that's a big number, right? 10 to the 10. And the resistivity really is the ratio of E over J. The magnitude of E over the magnitude of J. That's really what it is. It's the reciprocal of, of um, sigma. This model that I just went through is called the Drude model. It was one of the first simple models to, under, to help us understand what's going on in the wire. But we're neglecting quantum mechanical effects. Um, and again, like, like Rav Taj, you said, you know, the, the number of collisions that are taking place, let's say per unit time. Um, so our model is inadequate, but at least it shows you the relationship between J and E, and it allows us to actually derive, an uh, derive Ohm's law. Even though it's not accurate, at least I get to see the relationship between J and E or, or I and delta V. Oops. Is that picture gone? Sorry about that. Now, rho resistivity does depend on temperature. And resistivity is hard to derive. So we have, people have done experiments to look at the resistivity of a material as a function of temperature over a limited region of, over a, 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 a limited range of temperature. 
resistivity has a following form. And those of you who had physics 215 price on equation, it looks like this. So resistivity, resistivity uh, does change with temperature, but over a limited temperature range, it's linear. And for us, all we need to say is we know this empirically, okay, meaning from experiment. We don't have to delve into the, 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 the theoretical details. If you're an engineer, you need, to underst you need to know this. That you need to understand the relationship between these two. Physicists, not as much, unless they're doing condensed matter physics. Okay. This is called a coefficient of resistivity. So would this be useful for anything? Especially those of you who have had 215 or are taking 215 concurrently. Would knowledge of that equation be useful of anything? Well, let's, let's do this. If R depends on temperature, then I can write R this way as a function of temperature. Again, over a limited temperature range, I can write it like this. Would this be of any use? Those of you, get, you have had, those of you who have had 215, would that be of any use? Um, those of you who had 215, you talked about measuring temperature already? Couldn't I measure resistance and then I can determine temperature? Couldn't I use this as a thermometer? Because if I know R, then I know T. This gives me a way to measure temperature because it's easy to measure R. It's actually hard to measure T. Okay. In fact, the standard that's used to, to define the temperature scale involves measuring the resistivity of platinum. Okay. So any device that uses resistance to measure temperature is called a thermistor. Now alpha, this quantity alpha called the coefficient of resistivity. If you solve this for alpha, just if you solve this expression for alpha, alpha is one over rho naught. The value at T naught, typically T naught is 20 degrees Celsius. Okay, so this would be delta rho. Normally, if you want to know the value at any temperature, you take the limit as this thing goes to zero, so it's a derivative. We have one problem in the homework on this. I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on resistivity. Typical values of the coefficient of resistivity is about 10 to minus 3 per, per degree Celsius. Okay, and, then, and the answer is yes, I already answered that question. So remember that um, a conducting device obeys Ohm's law when the resistance of the device is independent of the magnitude and polarity of the applied potential difference. And resistance is defined to be delta V over I. So one last thing I want to talk about is um, electric power. Um, batteries convert... chemical energy into kinetic energy of the electrons. 
And this, what happens though, is when the electrons go through a wire, you produce, you increase the internal energy of the wire, it produces heat because of all the collisions. We call that Joule heating. By the way, Joule was the person who actually saw the relationship between uh, the energy in an in electric current and its relationship to heating things up. He was the person who saw it. He actually heated up water by running current through a resistor. They call it Joule heating. It wasn't Watt, okay, who, who, um, who related electrical, uh, what's happening in a wire to energy. It was actually Joule who did that. So what, is, what does the battery do? So uh, the battery does work on the electrons, giving them potential energy, and as the electrons go through the wire, their potential energy decreases as the charge goes through the resistor or through any element of the circuit. And so we define the electric power, the rate in which work is done, and you've seen this, dW dt, is dQ dt times delta V. So power is voltage times the potential difference times current. So power Oops, sorry. So power is delta V times I. And we can write this many ways because of Ohm's law. We can write it as delta V squared over R or I squared times R. Okay, and what are the units? Well, joules per second, because it's joules per second. This is, by the way, this equation that you see here, there's no law associated with it. Uh, folks in other fields associated with the law because students will remember it, but I'm assuming you guys can remember, can just remember these equations. You can derive this very easily. Okay. You can derive all these very easily from Ohm's law. But people in other fields, non-science fields, um, they, they associate this with a name, which is wrong. Okay. And just because they want to use it with an, uh, they want to give it a mnemonic, a way a student can remember it. So here's a question for you guys. Which bulb, you guys all have, have used uh, the incandescent bulbs in the past. Which bulb has a greater resistance, a 25 watt bulb or a 100 watt bulb? This is, this is a practical question because you deal with this in your house. Which, which bulb has a higher resistance? The one with the lower power? The one with the lower power has a higher resistance. That's true. So the question is why? It allows um, more amount to flow through it. It, it, it allows more what? I'm sorry. Like it, um, I don't know that more charge to flow through it. You um, mean the hundred watt bulb? Like my, I don't remember the values for both. Like the one with the higher power, it would have less resistance. Yeah. Um, so, th so that's what I, I guess part of it we need to understand. The light bulb, right? When you use a light bulb, 
Do you know, do you all know what voltage is across the light bulb? If I put a light bulb in a light socket in, in the house, what's the voltage across the light bulb? Do you know what's coming out of your wall socket? So the voltage that comes out of your, so voltage from the wall socket from most wall sockets or outlets, I'll say, is about 120 volts. That's, a, that's kind of an average value. It's not really an average. I'll talk about that later on this semester. Okay. So it's about 120 volts. So then all light bulbs really are designed for 120 volts. All the light bulbs are designed, you know, all those, the light bulbs you use in your house, they're designed for 120 volts. Okay, there's exceptions like the ones, you know, if you have patio lighting, those are 12 volts ones. But the ones that you screw into your light socket in, in one of your rooms, those are designed for 120 volts. So you got to put 120 volts here. Okay, now you can answer the question because if I make this bigger, this has to be smaller, right? I did not do any calculation. No, but, but, if, I make, like, but if I make yeah. this number bigger, the, the denominator has to be smaller for that given yes. V. Mm -hmm. Right? And so the greater the power, the lower the resistance. So you were right in saying that, but this explains it because all, all light bulbs are rated, well, I, I, almost all the light bulbs are rated 120 volts. Okay. You know, the ones you screw into your sockets in your house. Like I said, there's exceptions like your patio lights. Those, are, those run like a 12 volts or whatever. Okay. That makes sense? Yeah, so I, I was only thinking I was only thinking about the flow through the wire rather than going into the formulas. So like having less resistance made more sense to have more power. That's true. I mean, you're doing a more physical reasoning and that's true. So less resistance means the electrons have an easier time going through. But um, so you have more current. Mm -hmm. So you would be using this equation. Yeah, You'd be using indirectly. this form of the power equation, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I, I like going through this one just because I want people to be aware that what's in your, what comes out of your, most of your wall sockets is 120. The, the exceptions are um, if you have an electric dryer, electric dryer is 240. Um, if you have a rain, you know, um, oven, electric oven, that's 240. If you have an air, the air conditioner would be 240. Okay, those are the exceptions. The, the real heavy uh, uh, equipment, they're, they're going to run at 240. Or if you have a, a, a charger for your car, if you have a special charger for your car, that'll be 240. Okay. But pretty much everything else is 120. Your vacuum, when you, when you turn on the vacuum cleaner, you are drawing a lot of current. But, okay, so there's an effect called Faraday's Law we'll talk about in Chapter 31. So anytime you turn something on or off, you induce a large current. And that's probably why your lights flicker. And so if you've ever done, so it's something you shouldn't really do. If you've ever unplugged, the vacuum cleaner while it's still on? Have you ever done that? Oh, yeah, don't do it then. Because you will see sparks coming out of your outlet. Okay, okay, I've done it. All right, I'll say I've done it. So you'll see sparks coming out of your outlet. Okay, and that's because you have a, a big time rate of change of current. And that generates more current. You basically have a big change in magnetic field that generates more current. Okay. Which is not good for the, actually it's not good for the vacuum cleaner and possibly not good for you. Okay. Because you don't want to get zapped by that. 
So that's why the lights flicker, because, because you have a big change in current. And that produces a big change in the magnetic field. Okay. Um, last, last thing, and then I'm going to take questions. Okay, just one problem I'm going to do, just to see, just to show you how these equations work. This is a pretty straightforward problem. The homework, I'm going to add two days to the homework. Okay, because I have it due on the 7th. I'll make it the 9th. It's a lot of multiple choice questions. It's basically, do you understand the concepts and uh, know how to use the basic equations? It's, it's 28, the last chapter in the unit, which is the harder chapter. Okay, so suppose I have a circuit. With a resistor in it. And this is 45 ohms. And this is 9 volts. And I have an ammeter to measure the current. Okay. I want to, I want to know the current through my ammeter. Well, the current is going to be obtained from this equation. If delta V is IR, then I is delta V over R. Okay, and so I'm going to take 9 volts divided by 45 ohms, and that's going to give me uh, 0 0.2 amps, or 200 milliamps. If I want to figure out the power dissipated by the resistor, I have three choices. I'll just use delta V times I because I know I and I know delta V because the voltage across the resistor has got to be 9 volts. Okay. So, um, power is going to be 9 volts times 0.2 amps is 1.8 watts. How much charge is delivered by the battery? What's delta Q? Charge delivered by the battery. Well, since I is delta Q over delta T, and I can say this because the current's constant, then Delta Q is I delta T. If the current was not constant, then this would have to be an integral. And so delta Q is going to be 0.2 amps, which is 0.2 coulombs per second, times the amount of seconds in 15 minutes. How many seconds in 15 minutes? Nine hundred fifteen times sixty. Where does that come out to be? One hundred eighty coulombs. So Chase, you asked a question: Do we consider forward currents? I'm not sure what you mean by that. I mean, I'm going to say the current is going to be. I'm going to use conventional current. You can you can choose either direction. Okay, Chase? I mean, you can say the current is this way or that way. I'm not sure what you mean. Okay. But it, it, it's not going to make a difference. Your answer will be the same. Now, how much energy is delivered? Energy is power times time. So it's going to be uh, 1.8 joules per second. times 900 seconds. I could also take the, uh, the 180 coulombs and multiply by 9 volts because a volt is a joule per coulomb. So if I take 180 times 9, I should get the same answer. Okay. So in chapter 27, just get you familiar with Ohm's Law. So, um, 
there was a question on the multimeter quiz. So go ahead and ask the multimeter quiz question. Well, it should be a bag of You should have a bag of wires in your kit. Ooh, that's not it. Chase, there should be a bag of wires in your case in, in your kit. If you didn't get a bag of wires, then you need to get one. Let me let me grab the It should be like in a glad or like a Ziploc bag. It should be like in a, a, a Ziploc sandwich bag. It should be something, a bag like this. And there should be wires in there. Okay. If not, let me know. We need to get you some wires. But you should have a bag. Oops, wrong way. You should get a bag like this. Okay. No, it's uh, the discussion board. Not the quiz itself will be the multimeter quiz is due on the night. So, I, I, for the discussion board, I put due dates so that you see it's there, so you can ask questions. So, one of the things I want you guys to do is um, ask your question on the discussion board. I'm gonna if you email me a question on the multimeter quiz, I'm gonna put it on the discussion board, or I'm gonna say ask on the discussion board. Because we need to help each other out, okay? Because you, you, there's going to be more people, in the, more people than you are going to have the same question. Correct, Chase. If you see wires in it, then that's the right one. Okay, questions? Uh, any quick questions regarding the exam? Sorry, I took up so long, so much time. No questions? Concerns? Um, could you go over the equations for um, electric potential and then its uses in the solving for um, like the difference in electric potential? Hmm. Like, I understand how to calculate it for a point charge, but I'm a little bit more confused about calculating it for a surface or, like, a, a non-point charge volume. Something finite or not finite? I mean, you can... Um, something finite. Okay, so, right, V, then what you do is you break it up into a bunch of little point charges... Right? If it's finite, you could, you, you're allowed to use this equation. You're assuming V is zero. So you're going to be assuming V is zero at infinity in, if you're using this. And so all you got to do is set up your DQ. You're doing almost... Okay. And, it, Go ahead. and the DQ is based off of like either a given um, charge over volume, like charge change in volume, or it's... Is it, what's the constant... Like if it's not a, if it's a uniform versus if it's not a uniform. Right. I mean, this, just like the electric field problem. Remember the electric field problem you guys did? Uh, the worksheet? The worksheet. Whether you did the, yeah. and that was just one example, right? Because it was just a wire. Whether you do a wire or, or a sphere or whatever, um, you got to write the expression for DQ. That's, that's why that in the first unit, homer, problem number nine was so important that you had to understand how to do that one. Because everything, all the other problems are going to be based off that in order okay. for you to find your DQ. So it's really finding, all you got to do is find DQ and, and write an expression for R. So if I have a sphere, 
uniformly charged, let's say, okay? And um, you're inside, and we gotta be careful here because the, that one, this one's hard to do for a sphere, and the reason why is because you need to know the potential here to be able to solve it. Okay. Once you go inside the once you go inside it gets hard. But if you're if you're outside, if you're out here, you can break you, know, you want to break that up, that's fine. Okay, you can write your KDQ or R out here. We did a disk, I think I did a disk in class. You break this up into a bunch of rings, you set up your DQ, your R is gonna be basically the distance from here to any one of those rings. Okay, if you do the sphere, this method will work if you're outside here. If you're, if you're gonna go from outside to inside, then you're probably gonna to wanna to use this. And the reason why is because when you go from outside to inside, the electric field changes and you, you need to know what the field is on the, uh, the uh, electric potential is on the boundary. See, this, this equation assumes electric field is the same everywhere. So when you're outside here, you can use this equation anywhere up to the surface. When you're inside, you can't use that equation. Okay, because that's the equation for a point charge. Whether it's a you know, finite size or infinitesimal size point charge. Does that make sense? So, Rob says the infinite one will just be using. Let me check my time because I, I have the 9.30 class. Okay. Um, you need to know the electric field then. And then you would integrate the electric field. So if you, have a, if you have a plane, for example, let's say you have an infinite plane. So the field is an infinite plane. Is that. And so... And, and basically, this is in the I hat. Let's say you have a plane like this, and the field's that way in the x direction. So let me start. Let me, let me just look at the field on this side of the plane, not the other side. Okay. So this is going to be the integral from A to B of sigma over 2 epsilon naught I hat ds. And so this, since this is written in Cartesian coordinates, then my ds... I can write it this way. And only this term survives in the integral because the dot product is not zero. And so, this ain't a tough integral, right? So what are we going to choose as my, my bounds? Well, I'll just choose x2 and x1. So now I need, I need to know one of these two. I, I, and so I need to define which one's zero. That's it. So now you, you have the choice of where you, you, you define your zero for that one. So here also we could use that thing that it is zero at infinity and use that? I can't, you, I can't make zero at infinity. I can't make V zero at infinity. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. All right, because this is infinitely big. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
And so that's all I would do. I mean, if I had two plates, it's, that's even easier. I mean, that's what the battery does, right? So really, I mean, me, this, is, this is an easy problem. I just got to find which ones. I just got to give, give you a reference and I'm done. Could we use, like, could we find an expression for the electric field and from that find the, like, we have the expression for the electric field. Right. Couldn't we just... What did you do? No, I was uh, just saying we, we cannot simply multiply by the change in distance here. Like if E is, or V is E times the change, right? Yeah, the but that, that's only true if, if the field is constant, which it is here, but. Okay. Right, I mean, I did it this way because this is more general. But yeah, I could have said, oh yeah, mm -hmm. just take multiply by delta x, but that's, that comes from this. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, so sorry it took so long with the description. Um, sorry I got started late, I had some problems. Anyway, I'll, I'll see you guys at two. I gotta start my 9.30 class.